to say it's been a strange day so far. Uh, myself, I'm, so I'm a freelance uh, consultant and trainer uh, on cloud native solutions. Uh, I'm a Brit living in France for about 27 years, uh, so I'll soon be a, a Brexit uh, refugee, no doubt. Um, and I run a local uh, Docker meetup group and Python uh, user group. Okay. And uh, this is Grenoble in the French Alps where I live. Okay, so first of all, so uh, why, why would you want to go from monoliths to microservices? But first, a bit of history. Uh, so it's interesting, if you look back the last 20, 25 years, it's been quite phenomenal uh, the way computing has evolved. Uh, 25 years ago, you know, we were still running uh, bare metal servers and uh, uh, I guess if you, were, if you were running virtual machines, it was because you were running uh, IBM mainframes. I don't think there were many instances of virtual machines at that time. Then VMware came along. So then, you know, virtual machines became the new thing, running on hypervisors, which led on to, to cloud, uh, with a choice of hypervisors avail available. Um, so cloud, much more elastic uh, systems. Then containers came along, which existed before Docker, but Docker made containers really usable, um, and that has really changed uh, the system again. And the new uh, fad, I would say, uh, not, I, I believe in it, it's, it's real. Uh, the new thing I would say, new kid on the block, is serverless. So we're going to talk about microservices, which is a bit, um, actually, you know, you could do microservices on virtual machines or containers or serverless. Um, and one initial point I would say, well, the future will be hybrid. We will use all of these technologies depending on different constraints that are important to us. Okay, but why still would you want to move away from our wonderful monoliths that have been serving us so well? Well, these monoliths, uh, more or less, they're you know, big bricks of, of software that are developed in some sort of waterf waterfall uh, development mode, uh, where the new release is like six, 12 months out. It's only at that point an official release uh, comes out. In the meantime, if you need to patch, for example, it's a bit of a complicated process, both for the, the vendor and for the person deploying. Uh, and generally, you just don't have very much uh, agility um, uh, with, with monoliths. Uh, e even when it's an end-tier architecture, that you still have fairly large pieces of software that's difficult to deal with. And these are particularly uh, ill-suited to large enterprise scale or uh, web scale. And obviously, um, with uh, the sort of applications we have on the web today from the likes of Google and fa Facebook, basically the gaffer, uh, we're running at enormous scale. And so microservice really makes sense at that scale. Um, so uh, as I said, I mean, these are, you know, big pieces of software where the components are tightly coupled. Generally, uh, the, co the components uh, are sort of linked together with libraries. Uh, you can't separate out components very easily. Of course, those libraries could be reused, but there's still a whole sort of build process and packaging associated with that. Um, and so, generally, it's, it's difficult to, to move, difficult to evolve, to innovate. Uh, microservices, on the other hand, uh, we're really talking about uh, splitting up uh, an overall application into components where each component uh, does one function and it does it well, okay? And that has uh, several implications. That means that uh, when you're working at web scale, for example, um, you might have some parts of the application, maybe a database, um, which, you know, Actually, might be just one instance, but other parts, which maybe a front-end web server, which you want to scale uh, based on the amount of traffic coming into your system. Um, one of the advantages of cloud, of course, you know, w why why do you use cloud at all? You know, what's the big interest? Um, 
One interest is agility, ability to fire up new applications on the fly, but especially to, to scale out uh, based on the traffic coming from the network. And that, in particular, uh, allows to mutualize the resources in the cloud. So you want to be able to scale up uh, some components when there is need for them and scale down when there isn't need to make efficient use of uh, cloud or data center resources. Um, so microservice architecture components, they're, they're lightly coupled. What that means is uh, they're no longer uh, linked together as, as a binary, but they're interconnected over the network. Um, they can be scaled independently, and they can be deployed or upgraded independently, if you do it right, of course. Um, it isn't free. Uh, and being able to deploy and upgrade independently is really important to be able to um, quickly evolve your service and even, you, you can even replace implementations of some components because the components, I'm saying, do one thing, one thing well. Uh, you might decide, you might have an implementation of, let's say, a web server. Um, it suited you well to do that in Python in the beginning. Uh, now you want to go with uh, Go or maybe even C++ for ultimate speed. Uh, and with microservices, you can make that sort of change. Okay. So advantages, um, let's say, you do a component of a microservice does one thing well, and this means you can have small, focused project teams working on these things, who really are focused to just guarantee the functionality of this component. They might be working on several components, but you know, each one they, they have some focus on. Um, it's easy to scale. Uh, these components, uh, to deploy them, to test them, at least in the sense of unit testing, um, and so easy to, to evolve them. And also because they're separate components where it's just network communication, it's easy to compose new services from microservices. Uh, and so each component as well, you can choose to re-implement in like best of class technology change the implementation language or maybe change the implementation of a, a database, go from to SQL to some no SQL or graph functionality, whatever. So are there a panacea? No, of course, there's, there's some cost. Uh, of course, there's great complexity. Um, technically, you have more components and you have to manage more things um, and you need to orchestrate these microservices. Um, you also have greater complexity in your organization because you have more teams to manage. Um, and then uh, operationally in terms of monitoring, debugging, and end-to-end -end testing, so your overall service, um, these tasks are more difficult. Uh, network communication now is, is critical, so you really need to manage that in terms of latency and uh, detecting where problems are, maybe uh, doing what we call circuit breaking when a problem is detected to isolate uh, problems to one particular area. So there's a sort of um, a mindset of design to fail, uh, and, but to keep working when there are failures in your system. And then be aware, um, microservices are useless if you don't adopt best practices. Um, so. It's really essential if you're doing microservices, you really want some DevOps processes, you want behavior and test-driven uh, development. Uh, you need to be very rigorous about implementation, uh, implementing the APIs around these components. Uh, you have to guarantee your interfaces um, and you need to provide stable APIs with some degree of backward compatibility. So. Providing you stay with those best practices, then um, microservices are a, a good solution. So I mentioned uh, one thing is that we need to orchestrate. Um, so basically, now as these systems scale, you, um, they, as your application uh, scales across maybe a data center of uh, hundreds of nodes, or maybe even thousands, or maybe uh, with a cloud provider. 
as there are more and more instances of each component, it becomes impossible for an operator to, to manage that, and you just wouldn't want him to do that. So you want to do things, you want to be able to place your components uh, on different nodes to ensure uh, availability. If, if a node goes down, for example, that your overall service still continues to work. Uh, maybe uh, respect some affinity, non-affinity constraints uh, as well to guarantee the availability of the overall applications. And you may want to take advantage of specialized hardware. Uh, maybe monitor which containers are, are not functioning and whether they're started and ready to go. Um, and also, yeah, how are you going to upgrade your applications? Again, this is somewhere where an orchestrator like Kubernetes uh, can come in. Okay, so we need orchestration, and I'm going to assume that uh, we, we part with Kubernetes. I'm going to advance being a bit slow here, so I'm not going to present you Kubernetes, but if you're in this talk, I guess you're aware that basically Kubernetes is a, uh, a cluster management system coming from Google in initially, based on their experience of in-house uh, container orchestration. The basic architecture has a set of master nodes, which is basically the control plane, and a set of worker nodes where your actual containers will be running. I say containers, but actually we run pods in Kubernetes. Come to that in a moment. Okay. I'll skip over most of this. I want to spend time in it, but just to say that um, Kubernetes is a declarative system. You say, for example, you want to run um, an Nginx uh, web server. You're going to say to Kubernetes, okay, these are my constraints. I want, let's say, three replicas, three instances of this, and it's Kubernetes that then will see um, what's the ut utilization of the different nodes, and it will decide where to place um, those instances. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip just to pods, just to say, so a pod is a, a Kubernetes concept which represents one or more containers running together. Uh, the idea is that you have one main container which provides your functionality, let's say uh, a web server, uh, so I'm staying on that one. And any extra containers, we, do, we call them a sidecar, which are basically providing um, ancillary functionality, helping that main functionality. Uh, so we'll see an example of that with, uh, with Istio. Okay. Uh, so, as I was saying, I had. Um, intention of doing a lot of demos, but uh, it's been a, <laughs> a weird day. Uh, I will show just, nevertheless, um, th this is a visualization of, in fact, I'm running Docker for desktop. Um, this was the environment I was going to show, but my Kubernetes cluster on uh, DigitalOcean, uh, it went away yesterday, so I recreated it. Uh, today, I still had connectivity problems, but okay. Just to show, I was hoping to demonstrate across a, a three-node system, one master and two workers. But I will do oops, the same demonstration based on uh, Docker for desktop. Okay. So, uh, I will enlarge this because you probably can't see much. Okay, is that readable? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to um, just show how um, I'm going to uh, basically deploy um, a Redis um, key value store. command. Basically, you do the kubectl uh, create or apply um, of the YAML definition file for, for creating deployment. And what we're seeing here, uh, th this block is a set of 
Kubernetes objects that have the same uh, run tag or app tag. Um, and what we're seeing is uh, a deployment. Uh, I'm saying, okay, deploy me one instance of Redis. Um, ah, okay, that's a bug. You see it twice. And we, <laughs> um, we have um, a replica set. Oh, yeah, that, which you're not seeing, sorry. And that's uh, the third one is the pod. It will become clearer when I run the, uh, the example. I'm going to run uh, a Flask application, which would normally be uh, a front end. Um, OK, it was just read there as the container started up. Um, if it was having to take time pulling images, it would have stayed read a lot longer. OK. And I can do things like, um, so I've just, I should show you. Um, so the YAML file for creating those, um, basically you specify a num number of replicas up there. Um, so the, the initial version I did had replicas one, obviously. And now I'm going to rerun essentially the same YAML the replicas for. Okay. And we can see how it quickly creates uh, several containers, okay, several um, pods, rather. Um, if I had my other environment working, then these would obviously be distributed across the, the two worker nodes that I had. I'm going to move quite quickly. So I've got some slides just representing that deployment that I just did, but I will skip over those. Okay, so I've, I've tried to organize the presentation uh, by in, in two main parts, really, deployment strategies and architecture design patterns. Those might not be the best names uh, for these categories, but you know, naming is the hardest thing in uh, computer science. So You'll have to let me get away with that one. So first of all, first of all what do I mean by deployment strategies? Um, so basically, yeah, how, how are we going to roll out uh, our services to, let's say, our data center or our cloud? Our cloud? Um, and then how are we going to upgrade them and this sort of thing as services evolve? Uh, and so there's a, a group of things I'm putting under this banner. Uh, so, so um, there are deployment strategies uh, for sort of evolving a service, upgrading a service, and we'll look at some of those uh, examples. Um, some of these, oh, most of them can be implemented by Kubernetes alone. Uh, the more advanced ones like uh, uh, doing like canary rollouts or A-B testing rollouts uh, would require something like an API gateway in front. So I'm going to look at service upgrade strategies, um, health checks, and what we call the, the strangler uh, pattern. OK. So first of all, for service upgrade strategies, so really saying, for example, the, the Flask or Redis that I just deployed, you know, how can I go about upgrading, let's say, the, the Flask application uh, but in a way that it makes sense for the overall application. Uh, so, for example, um, the first way of doing this is a thing called recreate, uh, which is fine in development but not very good in production because you stop the old version of your application completely and then you deploy the new one. So, obviously, that's not exactly uh, very production friendly. Nevertheless, it is a deployment strategy which is fine for a developer on his laptop. Um, the one which is used by default uh, in Kubernetes is Ramped, which basically uh, Kubernetes will um, deploy a new version of an instance. Uh, once that's running, it will stop an instance. So if you have, let's say, uh, as I had here, four Flask instances, it will upgrade one. When it's ready, it will stop one of the existing ones, and so on. And so during the upgrade, uh, we will see we actually have a mix of 
all the new, tend to say blue and green uh, versions of the service. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one way of doing it. Advantage of that is that you require, well, you have a service running all the time. It's not like the first one where you stop everything. Um, but you get into a mixed situation, so you could have requests coming in that would be treated by the old or the new version, and you might even have some um, incompatibilities of API to manage. I mean, that's something you have to design out. Um, okay, so I will show that one in a moment. Uh, another way of doing it is blue-green. Uh, so blue-green, uh, if you have the, the old version running, you start up the same number of instances of the new version, and once they're all ready, you then switch to the new version. So that's great, sounds slightly ideal, except that of course it means you, uh, you need double the resources during the, the switch over time. That might not be a problem. Uh, Canary is basically saying, um, okay, I'm rolling out this new version of the service. I'm not completely sure yet. Uh, maybe I want to um, just allow it for 1% of the users, something like this. Uh, see if the phone rings uh, and roll back. Um, so, you know, try it and see. Um, and for that sort of functionality, you generally need to implement that um, in an API gateway or a service mesh, which we will, we will come to. And the last one is A-B testing, which is very similar to canary testing, but with the difference that um, you selectively uh, determine which version of the service uh, a user will need. So if you have a service in production and you actually want to um, upgrade it just for a certain class of users, for example, uh, it's just with them you want to test, then you could do that. And that, as well, would require um, an API, API gateway or service mesh to, to implement that. So those are the choices. Um, and I will show uh, an example of RAMPT, which is the uh, standard, well, sorry, the default uh, Kubernetes way of doing things. OK. So. Basically, I have another YAML file I'd already created. Um, it's, I should actually show it. In fact, if I do the... Um, uh -huh, okay. My terminal is a bit strange. I don't have copy, copy paste, but... Okay, if I do a, a diff with the one I, I just used to get to four replicas, uh, we'll just see that I'm using a different image in that file. I passed on. I'm going to pass from V1 to V2. So I'm going to perform that update, and we should see, uh, as I talk, there will be a moment where, okay, on the right is the four flask pods, um, all in version one, and we will see that we have more than that, more than four pods during the upgrade. Let's go fairly quickly. Okay, so we see new pods, okay, red until they're up and running. Okay, it's all gone. Okay, it's a shame I have a, a bug on my visualization because we would have seen the replica set and what we would have seen is <laughs> um, there's a deployment object which is FlaskApp and then we would have a replica set which represents the version one this flask app, and it is the one that creates the pods. And so what we would actually have seen <laughs> is uh, still the same deployment, but we would have had two replica sets. The old one now with zero instances, and the new one with four instances. And then these are the new flask app uh, pod instances, which you can see are uh, version two. Okay, so just to Careful where I click. That was just to give you an idea, show you something real um, around one of these strategies. Okay, so that's the demo I just showed you. Okay, 
Uh, another thing to do then is to validate, so containers, um, yeah, it's fine just deploying them, but um, we need to be sure that they are healthy before we actually put them online. So, you know, Kubernetes will uh, not want to route traffic to containers or pods that are known not to be functioning. And so, how do you do that? You do that through health checks. And there are two types of health checks, uh, liveness and readiness. So, I have a definition. Um, li liveness basically is detecting that the, the pod and its containers are themselves just up and running. Uh, whereas readiness is detecting they are actually capable of serving traffic. Okay, and there are three types of probe that you can do. Um, so either a, a command to execute, uh, check something about the container, um, or an HTTP request to try. So typically you would just have a um, like the standard URL, but with a slash health or something like that uh, to test, uh, or a TCP request to try. And it's Kubernetes that's going to basically poll uh, your pod to see if that health check uh, passes or not. Uh, likewise, there are so readiness, readiness probes. Um, so the first one, although there are sorry, things like an HP re HTTP request to tr try, this might be just a test to verify that the pod is there, that it's up, okay? But not necessarily testing your application yet, okay? With the readiness probes, the idea is it's actually going to be testing the application, so it's a second uh, stage of readiness. And these are the same probe types as for the liveness probes. Same type, but maybe some different uh, URL should be tested. Okay, so the definition of a liveless probe is, liveness probe is something like this. Um, so in this case, it's um, something that you exec on the container. Um, and uh, you can specify the initial delay when to start testing and during what period. And Kubernetes could determine that well, if after a certain time this doesn't succeed, then we should just destroy that container and or that pod and create another one. And readiness probes um, are exactly the same. It's literally just the keyword liveness probe is replaced with the readiness probe. So I just wanted to say, okay, that's an important thing about uh, the way Kubernetes operates in deploying uh, pods. Uh, the other thing is, so how do you go actually from a monolith? That's actually the subject of the talk. So, you know, how would you do that? It's not easy. You, I've said it's a monolith. You know, how the heck you know uh, move to microservices? You know, you can do. Uh, uh, re-implement everything and six months down the line, yes, we've got the new service. Um, exactly the same functionality as the old service, but you know, you've lost six months. So you probably want to have some more sort of incremental way of moving to microservices. Um, and basically the strangler pattern provides a possible solution to this. The idea is that um, you would progressively um, take out or disable parts of your monolith application and re-implement them in microservices. And so you would be in a gradual transition until you have lots of microservices and maybe just one small part of uh, the monolith which is left functional, which is being strangled by the, the microservices. So that's what the strangler pattern is. It's basically a migration uh, deployment strategy. Um, this is something I took off uh, the Azure uh, documentation site, just showing the migration from left to right, from lots of legacy and a bit of the modern microservice implementation through to having just the, uh, the modern implementation where you finally, you've strangled uh, the original monolith. Okay. The other thing I want to talk about is like 
I grouped as architecture design patterns. Okay, so really, um, so I'm not talking about like standard component design patterns, you know, Java design patterns or whatever that you might have within your components. That's another another subject entirely. Um, microservices themselves, it's worth mentioning, microservice is a design pattern. Uh, nor the sidecar pattern, which we mentioned exists, that the fact that you can have second, third containers within a pod. Um, now we're concerned with basically exposing services uh, and ingress functionality, uh, so providing access to services within the Kubernetes cluster itself. And I'll come on to that. And then externally around your cluster, uh, the use of things like an API gateway, a service mesh, and um, even more advanced API gateways um, based on what we call the API gateway pattern. And I would say this, this part is real uh, war zone, that, that last bit of API gateway and service mesh. Um, there are several API gateways uh, really well established, something like Nginx, uh, HAProxy and so on. But now we have service meshes coming from Istio, Linkerd and so on. Um, and there's quite a battle going on between the gateways themselves, between the service meshes and between the two of them. Okay, so that first part, uh, looking at how we access uh, our services. Um, so, you know, we've deployed them as a set of um, pods, um, but so far we don't actually have a way of addressing them. Each pod has its own IP address and maybe is exposing some ports, but th those are specific addresses to a particular pod. And the very nature of Kubernetes or these container platforms is that uh, pods or containers are coming and going. They're, they're dying or they're being scaled up, scaled down. So you certainly can't depend upon uh, the pod IP uh, uh, remaining valid. You could attach to a host uh, with something like uh, what we call node port or host port. Um, but then you're exposing your infrastructure and you don't want to do that. Actually, the same thing uh, if you were addressing directly the, the pod as well. You, you should actually be on an isolated network, and that shouldn't be something you should be exposing into the exterior. So what we need is uh, basically service endpoints, um, a well-known address that we can use to address uh, our application, and then the platform will take care of routing that through to the pods that implement that service. Okay. Oh, sorry, I, I, I've said most of what is on here. Um, okay. So the basic principle is uh, we have this service of some, some sort uh, which is going to uh, access and load balance across uh, the various pods available in our system. And our end user of application, he should just need to know the service IP and port or, or host name. Okay, uh, this is where you would have reverse proxies that map to a, a nice application name uh, through to some internal uh, address on your system. So there are various ways of doing this. Uh, node port and host port are. Uh, almost the same thing. I don't remember the difference, but essentially it's uh, providing an access direct to the, the actual cluster nodes of your system. Uh, there's cluster IP, which is an internal address which is addressable uh, by pods within your cluster. So it's purely internal. And there's a load balancer. Uh, typically, um, load balancer functionality requires an actual implementation of a load balancer. So when you create a service on, uh, I don't know, um, uh, AKS or GKE or whatever, if you create a load balancer service, it will actually, uh, behind the scenes, it will be integrated into their infrastructure. Uh, if you run a mini cube, which is sort of a Kubernetes in a, in a VM, um, there is 
uh, that functionality already implemented. Uh, if you're doing it your, yourself on uh, a VM you've created, then you'd actually actually have to add something like an Nginx to do that uh, load balancing. OK, so node port, basically, uh, your user who's wanting to access your application will attack this well-known endpot, and that will be mapped onto, um, if I sorry, in this case, <laughs> you'll actually address directly the IP and port of one of these nodes. Okay. So that works, but you know, you're exposing part of your infrastructure. Load balancer, on the other hand, you really have an independent uh, endpoint address and it will take care of uh, balancing across the nodes, of course, and addressing to the specific pods. Um, and ingress controller, so, um, in fact, ingress is the process of controlling access into your cluster. Um, and an ingress controller would actually be an external uh, element like an Nginx or HAProxy or something which will implement the ingress rules that you specify about how to access your services. I, I don't want to do a, a demo on that. There are slides just on creation of a, a load balancer service. Um, actually, what I will do, because I had prepared that, So I can add so if I were going to use this application, I would actually uh, create a service on my Redis application here. And in my architecture, this would be basically used internally. It would be so that my Flask front end can attack the, the Redis database. And if I wanted to access my Flask application from outside, then again, I would create a service for Flask application. OK. Interesting. I, I now see the, the replica set there that appeared that wasn't appear, appearing because of a bug. OK. I don't want to spend long on this. Um, I really want to get to. I'm running out of time, and I want to move on to uh, API gateways and service meshes. So API gateways, um, essentially, it's an external software which will be doing typically things like access control, load balancing, maybe reverse proxy functionality, uh, and allowing to access services within your Kubernetes cluster um, without seeing the internal structure. Okay. And there are things that this can be doing, um, things like um, TLS uh, encryption, um, and essentially doing so offload from your cluster. Um, you don't have to implement these things in the microservices, but you'd want them at the entry into your, your cluster. Um, and actually on the diagram, uh, another functionality which is important is that they might be doing protocol conversion as well. You might be just wanting to expose uh, an HTTPS um, API, but internally that's going to map onto to REST, to RPC, to whatever. And there are many examples of API gateways which uh, exist. So I've just named a few there. Nginx, HEProxy, um, I guess uh, traffic should be on there. Um, and there's a newer generation uh, based on Envoy, uh, which are being created. I will come on to that in a moment. Um, okay, I'm personally going quickly, so I want to get on to so the next contender is Service Mesh. So, one problem with microservice is well, first of all, the network communication aspect is much more critical. So, uh, there are things like uh, detection of errors or um, maybe circuit breaking or these sorts of functionalities uh, or maybe just logging or encryption. There are a lot of functionalities which could be common to all your functions. So you don't want to actually 
implement in, in each microservice, or well, these are going to be uh, micro monoliths, um, and the size of those uh, the container images is going to be larger. So the approach with service mesh is to say, okay, well, we will create um, a cluster-wide capability which provided these, provides these services over the network, of course. Um, and so this reduces a lot of the um, functionality you would need to do um, within the, uh, the microservices themselves. Oh, yes, and one point is, um, you know, initially with microservices, people tend to implement these sorts of things, but then in libraries. Um, but given that one advantage, or maybe a risk with microservices, is that you can be polyglot. You might do one uh, component in Python, one in Go, one in Rust, etc. Um, but of course, if you're building with uh, uh, common libraries, nice to have. Uh, you might be having problems then with your polyglot environment. So that's you know, something you don't have with service mesh. Basically, it's provided by a set of containers that are external for your actual microservices. And this offload functionality is provided through sidecar containers. Um, okay. So um, there are other examples. I'd say the two main service meshes around today, um, I mean, certainly have a lot of traction, are Linkerd and Istio. Um, it was looking for a while like Istio is uh, just gaining so much uh, mindshare. Um, basically, it's supported by, uh, part of it came from Lyft already. I think they created Envoy Proxy. Um, supported by IBM, Google, and others. So, you know, there's a lot of traction behind it. But there's still uh, Linkerd, which has been around for longer, and I read just uh, a couple of days ago, uh, they've secured some uh, venture capital funding. So, uh, that's good. I think, you know, we're open source. We do need more than one uh, solution for each of these uh, functionalities. Uh, so very quickly, um, with an Istio implementation, what you would have is uh, an Envoy proxy which is going to run in each of your pods. Uh, I think I won't have the time to show a demo of that, unfortunately. Um, but basically, when you install Istio, you can then enable a namespace within Kubernetes that any pods that will be created uh, will be created in Istio mode. So if I were to recreate my Flask application, I, I actually did it just earlier as a test, um, in an Istio-enabled namespace, then we'd find that the pod that it creates actually has two containers automatically. There is the Envoy proxy, which is inserted into our, our microservice pod. Uh, so in this way, basically, all network communication from our microservice is going to pass via this uh, Envoy proxy, and so you know, we've offloaded things like uh, encryption functionality into the service mesh. Uh, okay, so let me just say um, service mesh, it, um, there's a lot of traction around that. Um, the service mesh vendors are saying today, well, we still need um, API gateways today but maybe not tomorrow. So, you know, service mesh is really about this uh, east-west traffic between services within, um, within your cluster, as the API gateway is really up top, north-south traffic into your cluster. But Istio, for example, uh, I think about six months ago, they added uh, first implementation of gateway functionality within Istio. So they're starting to north-south traffic. Uh, nevertheless, there really is uh, there really is room for both. Um, I'm going to try to move on very quickly. Um, so there's another sort of API gateway which is coming out based on what we call the API gateway pattern. It's actually this guy, Chris Richardson, um, who turned the coin. 
And it's basically talking about an API gateway functionality where uh, the gateway understands uh, the APIs that are passing through it, and it also uh, maybe understands the APIs of the infrastructure on which it is running. And so an example of this is a project called Glue. It's an open source project from a company, Solo.io. Um, and they're, they're demonstrating how they can do uh, hybrid applications uh, where because of their understanding of different protocols and uh, the APIs that are being used and the, the infrastructure API, they can actually allow sort of a more flexible way of um, uh, federating across existing legacy, so monolithic apps, microservices, and then like the next step in a way, serverless, where serverless functions could be considered the uh, nano uh, services. So I really wanted to just, I, I've run out of time, but I really wanted to get to that and say that that is the interesting next step uh, in microservice evolution. So I encourage you to have a look uh, at what uh, Solo.io are doing. They're a small startup, been around for about 18 months. Um, they have several tools for helping to migrate to uh, microservices. Okay, I'm gonna, I basically said what's on this slide. So, so to summarize, I mean, microservices, they offer new deployment uh, possibilities, um, really increasing the agility, the ability to deploy, to scale, and upgrade um, more, more easily. And they can also facilitate best-in-class implementations of components. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that's useless if you don't adopt uh, best practices. Um, and, and that includes not just the, the design, but in terms of your organization, the way these teams work together. Um, you can do incremental rollouts with like the Strangler pattern, for example. Uh, of course, you can do greenfield deployment if you're really lucky. Um, there are as well hybrid approaches, like I've just shown you using this uh, project called Glue. Um, and then there are it's interesting to offload a functionality via API gateway and or service mesh. I would maintain that I think for foreseeable future, we will see both of these being used. Okay, thank you. It was a bit quick and sorry for the lack of demo. But, uh, any questions? Okay, uh, we are a little running out of time. So uh, if you guys have any question, Michael will be here today evening and tomorrow, whole day. So please contact him. Uh, so uh, please uh, put your hand together for Michael for a great and wonderful presentation. Thank you.